Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Risk, Stress, and Scarcity, Water Challenges on a Planet Under Pressure. It seems we all have our water epiphany, and it's the moment when we realize that water is magic. It's the source of life, and it's priceless, especially when it's gone. And the great irony of our era, our blue planet, is thirsty. I'm J. Carl Ganter, Managing Director of Circle of Blue and Vector Center. And over the next 50 minutes, we're going to take you to the front lines of the global water crises and talk about how we're going to solve some wicked problems. And yes, according to the Harvard Business Review, a wicked problem has many causes. It morphs constantly and has no correct answer. But it can be tamed with the right approach. And we'll share some of the things that we can do together to tame these problems and help shift the world's dangerous course. We're going to hear from Sandra Postel. She is founding director of the Global Water Policy Project. She served for six years as freshwater fellow of the National Geographic Society and is author of most recently of Replenish, the Virtuous Cycle of Water and prosperity. And we're joined by Dr. Kareem Ahmed. Kareem is an internationally recognized expert in environmental sciences, natural resources management, technology assessment, and public health. And we'll get to your questions and what you can do. Please put your questions in the chat at any time. We're going to frame our conversation today around three overarching questions. One, how do we solve water challenges in ways that prioritize both people and nature? And two, how do we get beyond talking about water itself and speak and act more systemically? And number three, most importantly perhaps, is what does success look like? Where do we need to be in two years, in five years? And how do we know that we're headed in the right direction? But first, as a journalist and photographer, I'm gonna take you on the front lines and share some of the faces and the places for some context. My own water epiphany was on assignment for National Geographic, diving with the US deep caving team, literally into the arteries of the Earth's fresh water supply. I can never think again of groundwater the same way. It was clear then that the future would be defined by water, and that future is already here. I found this ironic that the World Economic Forum ranked water crises, and that's plural, as the world's number one greatest risks of greatest impact, even higher than climate change, even higher than pandemics. And that was in 2015. Speaking of climate change, one of my favorite quotes is this, if climate is the shark, water is the teeth. This is Urumqi in far west China. It is one of many cities that relies on declining water flows from mountain glaciers. And this is a, fa a favela in Sao Paulo where water is delivered by truck and there's virtually no sanitation other than the river that runs black with sewage. It was especially poignant that the muddy alleys were named for the towns that people had left behind, many due to drought and crop failure. In California and many of the world's most productive ag regions are water stressed. How do we grow our food and even generate our energy in a water stress future. And our urban centers are stressed too. What happens when a city runs out of water and reaches what a clever headline writer coined day zero? That's the day when the taps could run dry. Dozens of cities are on the list of candidates. And this is what a day zero candidate city looks like right now. This is Jakarta. The city is sinking due to overdraft of groundwater while the seas are rising. I was literally standing on this seawall in the upper right corner when the country announced that it would move the capital from Jakarta to an area with less water stress and with functioning sanitation. So you remember groundwater? Well, this is what groundwater looks like for billions of people around the world. This is in Delhi is just one of the millions of undocumented wells in India this particular well only runs about two hours a day, and back in the distance, the women are lined up filling their jugs with water for washing, drinking, and cooking. And remember the value of water when it's gone? Well, in most parts of the world, water has little value. This farmer in Punjab, India, lets his wells run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just because the electricity is free. It's truly mutual assured depletion. 
And there's no doubt that we're on the verge of a data revolution, yet we make assumptions that the data is always available. This is the data center for the Punjab Department of Irrigation. I was really careful not to wake up the servers asleep in the corner. For you geeks, that's a data joke. But we also have an era of communications and empowerment that's unfolding that can really, that can really lead to transparency and accountability. So this man in Hyderabad showed me the river that flows past his home. Sometimes the foam rises up to his front door if he only knew who to send the pictures to. So that's just a taste of my itinerary, and there are many, many more issues and connections. And so we're going to turn to our panelists. Sandra Postel, you've written that we've lost our sense of respect for water. So set us up. What's that mean? Well, you know, Carl, we are accustomed to thinking of water and talking about water as a resource, right? Kind of like we talk about coal or oil as energy resource. But in fact, water is so much more than a resource. Of course, it is a resource, but it's so much more. Um, water is most fundamentally the basis of life on planet Earth. Without water, we don't have life. Water is finite, but of course, our demands for water have not been finite. And so, you know, we think about everything in our daily life, everything we're using, buying, wearing, eating, uh, takes water to make and sometimes a surprisingly large amount of water. Um, if we're wearing a cotton shirt right now, it could have taken 700 gallons to make that cotton shirt. One cup of coffee, 34 gallons in a cup of coffee. If we're an average American, uh, the work we did shows that, you know, our water footprint, um, it takes about 2,000 gallons a day to keep our lifestyle afloat if we're an average American. And about half of that is in our diet, about a third is in our energy. So, so it's a lot of water. So when we look around the world today, you know, what we're seeing is just a lot of signs of, of trouble. Rivers are running dry, major rivers are running dry, no longer reaching the sea. We have an incredible amount of groundwater depletion, especially in very important food producing areas. So our agriculture and food security are at risk. Um, we've lost up to 50% of, of the world's wetlands. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, some colleagues and I published a, a, piece of, a piece of research in the journal Elementa uh, that showed that about 70% of irrigated agriculture and as many as half of the world's large cities now experience uh, periodic, at least periodic, water shortage. So this is a big threat to urban areas and, and to agriculture. The other thing that we, that we forget to acknowledge is that the global data now show that we are literally seeing an unraveling of, of the web of life. For every 100 frogs and fish and other freshwater vertebrates that were around 50 years ago, 1970, we now have only 17. That's a population decline of 83% in, in half a century. You know, can we meet the needs of our growing society while at the same time still sustaining the ecosystems that not only support us, but support the whole web of life on the planet of which, of course, we're a part? So that's the question. And I believe the answer is yes, but only if we do a couple of very big things. And the first of those is shrinking our human water footprint, figuring out how we can live healthy, productive lives but consume less water in the process. And the second thing is to intentionally fix that broken water cycle. Um, Reem, I wanna to turn to you. Um, so Sandra talked about this unraveling of the web of life and the level of urgency and the cycle. Um, why don't you pick up on that? What, what is, what's the existential question that's, that's uh, capturing your attention? It's the, the problem of water scarcity is a planetary crisis. As Sandra said, it, it affects human communities and natural ecosystems. And the important thing for all of us to remember is that natural ecosystems is part of what this planet is. Without it, we would not be here. So we have to keep always in mind when we talk about the need for water, not just for human communities, it's for all biota and for biodiversity. 
without biodiversity, we would not be here ourselves. So it's very important to keep all of that in mind. The thing that I'm going to try to concentrate on in this session is the impact on third world countries. So for example, uh, Sandra mentioned about climate change. It has a tremendous impact on our life, both in developing and developed countries, but it's much more acute in developing countries because it's happening right now. Um, so for example, many of the extreme weather events that we hear about, uh, we have some of them in this country with uh, more, more intensive hurricane seasons and we have wildfires. But in places like Pakistan, where I'm from originally, in, uh, in the year 2010, we had 13 million people were displaced from the Indus River Valley because of uh, flooding. And of course, this was caused by monsoon. Um, but on the other hand, today, in the South Asian area, we have an increased um, melting of glaciers uh, to the extent where we have about uh, in the Himalayan mountains, for example, there's 56,000 glaciers, about 500 of them have now melted to become into lakes, which are now sitting behind uh, earth dams. And from time to time, they have um, over, and, 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 and this causes flooding down in countries like Nepal and Bhutan recently. This may become a more common event in all of South Asia, and particularly the Northern Plains of India and Pakistan. The whole area of um, um, the, the, the Himalayan mountains, the Karakoram Ranges, Hindu Kush, the watershed uh, goes all the way through uh, the Indus River, the Ganges River, the Brahmaputra, the, um, the rivers that flow into Southeast Asia, the Irrawaddy, the uh, Salveen and Mekong, and also into China from the Tibetan highlands, the Yangtze Kiang and the Yellow River. So you can imagine about 2 million people, billion people, I'm sorry, are going to be affected by it in the next few decades. Um, it's been estimated by the United Nations that by the year 2030, 10 years from now, over 700 million people are going to be displaced because of water scarcity. The question is, where will they go? And right now, there is a great deal of concern um, that, and as Sandra pointed out, a lack of groundwater in many parts of the world where agriculture is very important, even in the United States. And so between agriculture need and drinking water, and drinking water becomes a very major issue in third world countries. Um, many communities still lack adequate amount of clean water and adequate sanitation. One of the great success stories in recent years has been the fact that the Millennium, millennium development goals of the United Nations was met in terms of clean water by the year 2010, five years ahead of schedule. Between um, 1990 and 2015, over 2.6 million people had access to clean water. And yet, even after that success, we will be faced with enormous amount of scarce of, of water in the years to come. The biggest problem in third world countries is adequate sanitation. About two million, two billion, again, sorry, uh, have um, lack of adequate sanitation, uh, which causes a tremendous amount of problems in terms of childhood uh, illnesses. Um, childhood diarrhea is one of the uh, largest cause of death of children below five years in developing countries. So the question of, of water becomes extremely acute in third world countries compared to what it may be in the developed world. But nevertheless, it is a global problem. It's a problem that we all face and we have to figure out a way to deal with the problem. One of the um, suggestions that Sandra made earlier about our water um, footprint is very important. So for example, if you are a vegetarian, you're doing very well. You use about five times less water um, per amount of food you consume than a meat eater, for example. And that alone gives you an understanding about the connection between food, uh, energy, and water. They are very much interrelated. So my, one of the, one of the uh, suggestions we could make, and the Swedish um, NGOs have made for a number of years, is to have uh, water labeling uh, on food and uh, products that are sold on the marketplace. 
that would be one way for us to learn uh, what our actual consumption of water would be, along with, for example, knowing about our energy footprint. So those are some ideas that should be um, thought about creatively. I think the most important thing is public education. There is just, as Sandra pointed out, a loss of respect for water. We just don't realize, we take it for granted. I think Karim's point about public education is, is really critical. Um, you know, we've had this tendency to, to sort of leave water problems to the engineers. And we very much need to educate the public about what this water footprint consists of um, so that we can be, you know, empowered, have the information to make personal choices to conserve water. Um, and, and to change, Kareem pointed out, dietary change, extremely important. Um, and so there are very tangible things, you know, we, we can do. And we all live in a watershed. We can all get involved in, in how that watershed, you know, is, is managed. You know, I live here in the Rio Grande watershed. And one of the things that's been so inspiring here is after one of the biggest mega fires that occurred in, in this part of the, world, of the country in 2011, New Mexico came together, businesses, NGOs, uh, almost all levels of government to create what's called the Rio Grande Water Fund. The Nature Conservancy is spearheading it. But everyone is participating to rehabilitate the watershed, go out there and do the prescribed burns, do the tree thinning so that the next time a fire erupts, it won't be this, this mega fire. It seems like some of the biggest levers to pull um, or that might be resistant would be on the policy side. Absolutely. There's just so much we can do on the policy side. Um, I'm not even sure where to begin, but, um, you know, one of the things that I uh, learned the most from, I would say, and even having worked on water issues for 35 years, you're still obviously learning a lot of things. In my, in my last book, I spent a fair amount of time thinking about soil and the soil reservoir. You know, soils globally can hold eight times more water than all the world's rivers combined. So one thing we could do that would be so beneficial in so many ways is to actively restore the health of soils. Let's look at our U.S. Farm Bill and the things that we're encouraging farmers to do. Farmers are great business people. They're going to respond to incentives. One thing I should just quickly mention is there's a great success story in incentivizing conservation in our homes and in our businesses and in our cities. Most of us aren't even aware of it, um, but in 1992, at the tail end of the, uh, the first Bush administration, uh, we signed a, an Energy Policy Act that included a requirement that plumbing manufacturers, so the makers of toilets, faucets, shower heads, meet certain standards of efficiency. So what we did with that one piece of legislation was effectively build conservation into our homes, our offices, all new remodeling. And so our water use today is vastly lower per capita than it was back then. We are saving now as a result of that legislation, as well as a voluntary program, as Kareem mentioned, to label um, appliances like dishwashers and 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 uh, dishwashers and washing machines and so on, those things alone are saving 9 billion gallons of water a day without any change in behavior, no hardship to us. We just decided to do it and let technology take it from there. That's equivalent to nine New York City's worth of water every day that can stay in an aquifer, stay in a river, rather than coming into our homes. Thank you. Um, quick reminder to our audience, uh, put your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll come to those uh, in just a few moments. Um, Kareem, did you want, want to respond? It seems like we also have this misalignment of perception and reality. Here we are at an, at an existential moment, uh, a series of crises that are intersecting across the water space. We're seeing some positive policy responses and regulation uh, approaches, but yet we still have, I think, a problem uh, in the developing world, especially where the return on investment for, say, a road system seems greater than investing in watershed management or wastewater treatment, say, even in Jakarta. Um, how, how do we respond to that? The, the, the thing about what just Sandra just said is something very important, which might help us understand the issue at a, 
uh, kind of a larger level. Um, we can make a lot of incentive, uh, policy incentives, but until people make a choice to change their lifestyle, it's, it's, it's gonna be very hard for us to even implement some of those life, those, those policy choices we might be given, or even have um, manufacturers and others, farmers, for example. I think soil nutrition is something that we should be much more aware of in terms of both water and food production. Um, the fact is we don't keep all of this thing, uh, these matters together has been our biggest problem up to now. And that's where I think we should pay more attention to. Uh, for example, when you destroy a mangrove um, in a forest and you, you want to build a luxury hotel or do uh, shrimp aquaculture, that destroys a natural ecosystem that provides both um, natural, you might say, resistance against extreme weather events. The same thing when you destroy a, a marshland and all the ecosystem is destroyed there. They provide natural cleanup, for example, nitrogen cleanup, and reduces eutrophication of freshwater bodies. All of this thing has been seen as separate issues when they are in fact interrelated. So to me, if I could be engaged in any kind of a public education program, the most important thing was be to talk about all these issues at, at the same time without confusing people too much. So it sounds like there's a, a big role for the science community to to step in and be much more integrated. Um, how you know how, how do we do that? Um, we have a we have a, a terrific audience here that comes from all you know all worlds, all corners. Um, how, how do we activate that? How do we activate that level of engagement? The good the, the wonderful thing about water is is that it's trite but true is that it does connect everything. Um, and if we start from the point of water being the source of life. It means that we've got to think differently about what we're protecting and what we're and what we're managing. And so, um, you know, I think we we need we need a conversation across science and across civil society at, at large, scientists and non-scientists, about what it means that water is the source of life. That is a very very profound question, and it's a very important ethical question. Um, and I, 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 you know, I, I think about this all the time. How, how do we have a conversation um, about the question, for example, um, you know, sturgeon have been around since the dinosaurs, plying the rivers of the earth. They could wink out our lifetimes. Are we okay with that? Or do we have a responsibility to the rest of life to now undo some of the harm we've done and, and, and manage water as if it mattered to everything? Because it does. Um, and it's not separate from climate change. We often think, OK, water, climate, they are so intertwined. Um, if we don't slow the heating of the planet, I don't think any of the solutions I've been writing about in any of my books will really solve the day. There is a huge discrepancy between the amount of water that's being consumed in the developed world against people who live in the developing world. So for example, an average person uh, consuming 3000 calories per day uses about 70 times more water than uh, say an average person using 50 liters of water per day in, uh, in a developing world. That is one of the sources of our problem that we have been so profligate in the way water resources have been used in one part of the world and so scarce in the other part of the world. How could we continue to call this a sustainable planet with this kind of disparity between those who are haves and those who are have-nots? Even though there has been improvement made in recent years in developing countries, it's not been enough. And the things are only going to get worse and climate change on top of it makes things even worse. So we are living in an existential moment in our history. Whether we can survive it depends upon how policymakers decide to change their attitude in most of the developing part of the world. Uh, we're going to come to questions here in just a second, and we're going to continue to think about, we're going to pivot a bit and think about what does success look like and 
how do we know that we're actually headed in the right direction? So put your questions in the chat and we'll be right with you.